We're continuing in the, the book of Mark, still Mark chapter 14, and we've been in the last couple of the last couple of weeks, we've been seeing this story of Mary as she brought her alabaster box and she, she anointed the Lord. And it was a beautiful moment. It was a beautiful moment, but there was those who were there who, who didn't like it. There were those who thought it was a waste, who thought the ointment had been wasted. And we saw the last time that Jesus said, let her, let her alone. And we just did an acrostic on the word alone, and we saw for the A that as God's people, we have been set apart from this world. You know, the Bible tells us that we are in this world. We, we go to work. We, 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 live amongst, we live amongst this world. We haven't been called to some monastery up the hill somewhere. We live in this world. We do the things of this world. But we know that God has set us apart for himself, that we have been chosen, and that God has chosen us. And even in this church, we know at times we are an independent church, and God has set us apart for many, and he set us apart from himself. And we, we see the importance of that, to serve God and to do the will of God. And we saw that, and the, the next point was for lonely. And it's good at times to get time to yourself. But sometimes if you've got too much time on your own, we can become lonely. And we saw, as just as I prayed, that it's important to be together. It's important to be together as a family, to share together. You know, as I said in my prayer, we were talking that, about that in the Bible class this morning, that during the Zoom, it was very difficult because we were in the house, we were on our own. And we could tune in and we could see each other for that time and we could we heard the word of God and we, we saw each other. But we were still pretty much separated. And you knew that when it came to the singing. You knew the singing, singing on your own isn't quite the same as singing in the church. And we need each other. And we need the family of God. Every one of us is part of the body and every part of the body is required. And we saw that. Then we saw in the, the O was for one, that there is one God and one saviour the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw that salvation is not Christ in our works, Christ in the church, Christ in saints. It's only in Christ. You know, so many religions say you must follow all of these rules. You must follow these things. You must do these things. If you don't do all these things, then you won't get to heaven. But we see that salvation is found in Christ alone. It's in Jesus Christ alone. It's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that God, he alone is the God and he is our savior. And he is who we trust in today. Who's who our trust is in tonight? We are not trusting in ourselves. It's not Christ has done his part and then we do our part. Christ has done it all. And Christ is keeping us. And it's through him that we were saved. Then the end was for none. You know, sometimes we feel that we are the only ones who are serving God. At times we may feel we're the only ones who are doing anything for God. And we saw Elijah. We saw Elijah. He was in Mount Carmel and he called down the fire from heaven on the false prophets. And he'd done great things for God. You know, Elijah felt when, when, um, when Jezebel was after him that he was the only one. That was his complaint to God. There's only me. There's only me who's faithful. And we saw that, that God could say to Elijah, there's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee. And you know, we thank God that God is a people. God is a people in every place, in every part of the world who are faithful to God, who are serving God. And you know, we thank God. We thank God for that. You know, we saw that sometimes when we, we feel that we're on our own, the importance of being there for other people, other people who might be on their own as well, to help them and to care for them. And we see that, you know, it's not a small thing to help other people. It's not a small thing to be there for other We might think it's not, not that big. But we looked in, in, the, in Matthew, and Jesus said, when you, when you visited the sick, when you fed the, the hungry, when you did this, when you visited those in prison, you did it unto me. And we see it's a big thing to God, and it's important. And then finally, we saw that he was for excluded. Oh, I've lost the, I've lost him. We saw that the he was for excluded, and we saw that, you know, if you are without Christ, if you are without Christ, then you will be forever excluded. You'll be forever excluded from the Lord. Thank you. You'll be forever excluded from the Lord, and. That's why we, we preach the word of God in the gospel, that you must come to Christ. It's not enough, as I say, to hear the word of God. It's not enough to believe the word of God. You, you must be saved. Perhaps you've heard the gospel so many times, you know about Jesus' death on the cross, why he died on the cross, that he rose again. You believe all of that. But you don't know the experience of what it is to be saved. You know, I knew that. I, brought, I was brought up in the church, as you all know. I heard the word of God as a little boy. I knew the stories. 
You know, there was one night that it became different. When it became more than just a story about Jesus dying on the cross for sinners, that night it became personal because I saw that I was one of those sinners. But Jesus had died for me. And that's what we pray for you if you're without Christ tonight. You would realize that you need to be saved. It's not enough to believe the Bible, not enough to believe there's a heaven and a hell. You need to know the Lord as your Savior. And if that happens, then your life will be changed. And that is your testimony. Our life has been changed because of what Christ has done in our lives. And it brings us to where we are tonight. You know, we see that Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? Trouble. You know, in this beautiful moment, in this beautiful moment of blessing, a blessing for Jesus, a blessing for Mary, there were those there who caused trouble. There were those there who, who were unhappy that what had been done, they murmured and they complained and they caused trouble. And we've all been in situations where we think everything is just going so well and then somebody causes trouble or a problem. We think, oh, why did this have to happen? How can, how can everybody not just go? How can we all just all go on? Whether it's in a church, in a family, in a workplace, you just think, how can we not all go on? And now this situation has arisen and you know that this is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem that has to be fixed and and sometimes you think, how will it be fixed? People have been hurt, people have been offended. And we see that at times trouble can come. And we think, how can it be resolved? You know, we're going to look at some points to see that, you know, trouble will always come. But how can we avoid trouble? How can we not be the, the cause of that trouble? You know, that is the first point, the cause of trouble. You know, some people just seem to cause trouble wherever they go whatever they do, no matter the situation, no matter how well things seem to start, how well things seem to go, you know that it won't be too long before trouble starts and you can almost be certain that they will be the cause of the trouble. They will do something or say something that will cause trouble and you think, this will not end well. This, this never ends well. You know, I'm going to look at three A's, three A's that we need to avoid. And if we can avoid them, I'm not saying we'll never have trouble, but they're certainly, they certainly lead to trouble. You know, when we get agitated, when we get angry, when we're argumentative, in almost all those situations, they will, lead, they will lead to trouble. But there's three Ps that will keep us from trouble. It's peace, it's patience, and it's being persuasive. You know, we see in the Word of God, over in 1 Samuel chapter 16, that, that Saul... Saul, King Saul was agitated. Just turn it over. In 1 Samuel chapter 16. You know, we see that Saul's agitation came from his disobedience. He'd been disobedient when he'd been told to wait for Samuel. He couldn't wait. He panicked. He panicked because he thought that the, 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 the people were fleeing from him, the army were upon them, and he, he made the sacrifice. Had he only waited, had he only trusted God, then this would not have been the situation. But he, he didn't wait. And we see in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 14, that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. You know, Saul had this agitation. I'm not saying if you're agitated tonight, you have an evil spirit from the Lord. I'm not saying that for one bit, but Saul did have this. Saul did have this, and we see that at times he became very agitated very quickly. Things agitated Saul, and things troubled Saul. And we see that he was disturbed by these things. You know, we see that on the day that would have been one of the greatest days in Israel's history, the day that David defeated Goliath, a day of tremendous victory, a day of tremendous joy when everybody was celebrating. When Saul heard the women sing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands, this really agitated Saul. If he was the king, he should have thought to himself, do you know what? Let David have his moment. This song was not accurate at all. It was just a song that they had been made up. So David hadn't killed his tens of thousands. David had killed, so, had killed Goliath. But he, he allowed this to niggle away at him, to niggle away and to agitate him, and it would lead as it almost always did to trouble, to problems for Saul. And we see that the same can happen for ourselves. Things can agitate us, things can annoy us. And before we know it, if we allow it, just like bitterness, 
If it takes hold, it becomes bitter. We become bitter. We become angry, and it becomes a bigger problem. Bigger problem than it. When you look back to where did it start, and it was this small thing that now has become a big thing. And we see for Saul, this agitation had came and had grown and had grown to the point where, you know, we see that he was he was now wanting to kill David. He now was planning to kill David, and that's where it went from from the song now to Saul's desire to end David's life. But we see that the answer to agitation is peace. Because still in 1 Samuel chapter 16, we see that they said to Saul, let me just get the verse. In verse 16 of chapter 16, they said to Saul, let our Lord now command the servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is cunning, who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit of God is upon thee that she shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. And we know that they go and they find David. And from verse 21, and David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. You know, we see here how, how much Saul loved David and how pleased he was with David, but yet the, how the agitation would come and would change that. And it, verse 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. You know, we see that, you know, you can't be agitated in worship. I mean, you can sing, but you can't worship because when you worship God, you have to be free from all negativity. You need to be free from all, all agitations or you're not really worshiping. Your mind is in other things. And if your mind's in other things and your mind's not in Christ, then we're not really worshipping. But, you know, we see that when we are really worshipping God, we're free from these things. You know, some of you dear saints tell us at times that, you know, you suffer from illness and you, can't, you find that you can't concentrate to pray, you can't concentrate to read, but what you can still do is worship. Still can worship. And we see how worship is a tremendous a tremendous way for us to, to, to speak to God and to be in the presence of God. And we see that, you know, to worship is to be free from all of the, the bondages as well, the bondages and all the problems and all the troubles. And we see that when David played that, that God's, that, that he knew this peace and he found that he found this peace. And we see that that is, that is the answer to these things, to know the peace of God. You know, it's, and I say it's different from being anxious. Anxious is a different thing from being agitated. I know sometimes we see that prayer is, you know, God will give us a peace and we pray for that peace at times when we're agitated. We need to pray and say, Lord, take this, take this agitation away from me. Lord, sometimes we need to pray for those who agitate us. Lord, Lord, pray for that. That situation really agitates me. Lord, I pray that you will, you will move in that situation and move for that person. You know, we see that, as I said, one of the other things we see is people who are argumentative, people who are argumentative, will find trouble. Trouble will never be far from those that are argumentative. And you'll find often with people who are argumentative, they'll tell you that they're not argumentative and they'll argue the point with you. You know, they'll be very quick. To, I don't, it's not me. It's not me. And then before you're, you're arguing about that, you're like, you know, we see, we see those that, that, that find that. They find that they, they just can't help themselves from getting into these types of things. You know, that's, there's a difference between having a disagreement, having a difference of opinion, because we can all have different opinions on, on many things. We can all have different opinions on things, but it doesn't mean that we have to, we, we are, we have to be argumentative. You know, we can disagree, and as Christians, we will often disagree with, with many of the people in the world. We'll disagree on morality, we'll disagree on sin, we'll disagree on how God, on the creation. But I guess it's how we, it's how we come to that situation. You know, I'm always reminded, and I thought of it last night when we were giving out tracks about the man who said, take a track or go to hell. You know, that type of, you know, he may be correct, but who will you win? Who will you win with that attitude? Who will you win with that, that aggressive attitude? Now, at the end of the day, we will never win anybody by giving them a track because salvation is Christ alone. But we want to be a, a good representation of what a Christian is. You know, when you give it a track, somebody doesn't want a track, you just say, thank, thank you, move on to the next person. Because we're not there to say, to try and chase somebody down and force the track on them. At the end of the day, how likely are they to read that track? How likely are they to be changed? You know, we see that we have to have the right spirit. The right spirit 
we can disagree in the right spirit. We can we, we witness in the right spirit. No, we know that the word of God is an offense. People don't like to hear that they're sinners, like to hear that they need to change. But we've, as we know, let the word of God be the offense, not us. That people are put off by the way we present the gospel, by the way that we conduct ourselves, that they think, no interested in that. The word of God will convict people. The word of God will show people and will make people uncomfortable. And they may be angry at the gospel, but let them never be angry that because it's the way we've presented the gospel. You know, may, may we always have this love and this, this love. Love not for the sinner. Not, love not for the sin, but for the sinner. To love the sinner, to see this person as someone that we were once a sinner, that we were once lost, but Jesus found us. That somebody told us that we have salvation and that we would share that with other people. That we would come and show the love of Christ. Show the love of Christ to those that are lost. You know, we'll turn over, while we're in Samuel, we'll turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 25, and we see someone who had the wrong spirit, an argumentative spirit, and again, it brought problems. I don't think it's 2 Samuel, I think it's 1 Samuel, because there is no 2 Samuel chapter 25. Just as well, I don't have pink here. He'd be thinking, oh, no, we know it's coming next, Santa Claus. He's adding books to the Bible. It's, so 1 Samuel chapter 25. And we see the story of, we won't read it all, but you know, it's the story of Nabal. It's the story of David and Nabal. And David's men had looked after Nabal's shearers when they were in the wilderness. And David sent his young men to this man, Nabal. And asked him, was there anything that he could provide for them? And his response was this in verse 10 of 1 Samuel chapter 25. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is this son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? And we see that this response we see that this response from, from Nabal was argumentative. He never came and said, listen, I don't, you know, he, he could have said, I have nothing to give them. He could have said anything. He could have given them it. But it was, it was his response. It was the way that he responded. And it certainly caused trouble. It certainly was, was about to bring problems for him and for, for all of his shearers and all that were with him. Because when David heard this message, David then became angry. David then determined that he was going to go and they were going to kill Nabal and, and all that he had. You know, we see that the cha what changed was, was, es was Abigail, was Abigail's response. And this is the, the persuasiveness that we see. And in verse 14, but one of the young men came, one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to slew our master, and he railed on them. But they were very good unto us. And we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we were, as long as we conversed with them when we were in the fields. And just over to verse 25, Abigail then comes and she takes provisions and she meets David on the way as he comes to, as he comes to Nabal. And she says, let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But thy handmaid saw not the young men that my Lord did send. And she goes on and she speaks and she, she says to David, listen, if you go ahead and, and do this, what you've proposed to do, when you become king, you'll look back on this and you'll wish that you hadn't done it. And she, he takes it. And her persuasiveness is what wins the day. And, he, and he, he takes her counsel and realizes that. And we see, as I say, it's how we, we can disagree about things. We can, but, and it doesn't mean that we all... We, we, that for persuasive, it means that everybody will then agree with us. You know, we see that we can be assertive in our, in, our, in our conversation. We can be confident in what we have to say and we can say what needs to be said. But that doesn't mean that being assertive means that everybody then does what we do, what we want to do, and we just keep going until everybody just gives up. You know, it's just that we, we can say our part and we can bring what, 
the disagreements that we have and share those disagreements, whether we be elders or office bearers or trustees or, or members, that we can have difference of opinions at times. It doesn't mean that we're right or we're wrong, but we can discuss them and in the spirit of Christ, we can come to, to resolutions. And, you know, we see that's the difference. People who are argumentative just will argue and argue and argue. And it's the way that they bring, they bring the thing that they have to say is the thing that causes, that causes the trouble. And then we see, if we are angry, if we are angry, it will almost certainly lead to trouble. And that's over in Esther chapter 3. And in Esther, we see the story of, of Haman and Mordecai and, and Esther. And in Esther 3, we see that, that Haman had been promoted. He'd been promoted above, we get that in verse 1 of Esther chapter 3. And after these things did Aharius, Aharius promote Haman, the son of Hamada, the Agagite, and advance him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning. But Mordecai bowed not, did, nor did him reverence. The king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath, and he sought to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for he showed, his, showed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Aharis, even the people of Mordecai. And we see that when we become angry, when we become angry, that we will lead to trouble, and this led to trouble. And he, was, he sought to wreak trouble, not just upon Mordecai, but upon all the Jews. You know the story, he went to the king and he got a decree signed that there would be a day there would be a month on a, on a certain day that they would rise up and kill all the Jews. And you know, we see that in these situations when we face angry people, when, when we perhaps may feel that we are becoming angry, that the answer is to pray. The answer is to have patience. patience pe patient people are never angry people. You know, at times we can have short fuses. At times things can, can, can agitate us and can annoy us and we become very angry and very reactive in that moment. And we, we become angry, and in our anger, we seek to do things, and we seek to we, perhaps we say things and do things that cause trouble that are not just as easily undone as they are said and done. You see, patience, patience waits for the matter. Patience holds back and says, let's see how the matter will fall. Let's see what will happen in this situation. And we see that Mordecai prayed. Mordecai prayed and trusted God, and, they, and the people prayed. And we see that God worked in that situation. And God turned everything around. And through Esther going to the king and through the prayers of God's people, all the trouble that Haman had sought to bring upon the Jews was brought upon him. And, you know, we see in the word of God, the word of God tells us the importance of, of being patient, of being patient over being angry. I'll just read it in, four, in Proverbs 14 and 29. He that is slow to anger is of great understanding, and he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. He that is slow, he that is patient to anger is of great understanding. If we can be patient, at times, at times we need to be patient with others. At times, as I say, there's people who perhaps make us angry, perhaps our, our, our kids, people in work, people we know, and we can get angry. And if we just had that patience to wait, patience and to take it to the Lord in prayer, that we would see that that's the, that is the answer. That is the answer to so much of the problems that we might face. And in, I'll just read again this. It's in Psalm chapter 40 and verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. And brothers and sisters, sometimes we need to be patient. Sometimes we look for the Lord to do things and we become perhaps agitated, maybe even angry that the Lord hasn't done what we thought the Lord would do. But if we have patience to wait, Patience to trust the Lord, to trust his promises and to wait and see what the Lord will do. Then we will, we will save ourselves a lot of trouble and a lot of, 
a lot of problems. The second point is not the cause of trouble, but in trouble. You know, we've all at times been in trouble, perhaps some of us more than others. But we know what it is to be in trouble. Jonah found himself in trouble. Jonah found himself on a ship in the midst of a storm. He found himself in the midst of the sea. He found himself in the midst of a fish. He had trouble. His troubles were because he had ran away from the word of God, ran away from God, disobeyed God. And sometimes when we walk out of the will of God, walk out of God's plan for our lives, and we say, we're going to do our own thing. We don't, you know, we're, this is too restrictive. What God asks of us is too much. I'm going to do my own thing, make my own choices. Inevitably, we will find ourselves in trouble. We'll find ourselves in a, in a situation we think, how did I end up here? How is all of these troubles came upon me? And we think back to the time when we walked away from God. There's people who have left the church out in the world and perhaps, perhaps they say, well, there's no trouble came to me. My life is good. You know, if they're truly the Lord's, they'll find themselves in a situation like the prodigal where they think, how did I get here? How am I in this situation? And they'll see that they need to get back into the, the will of God. But you know, not every time we find ourselves in trouble is because we have disobeyed the Lord. You know, the Lord found himself in trouble. He found himself in trouble with the religious leaders, with the Pharisees, with the scribes. You know, the Lord wasn't angry, but they were angry. Excuse me. They were angry with what Jesus said and what Jesus did. They didn't like him healing on the Sabbath. They didn't like the way he spoke. They didn't like anything that Jesus did. And Jesus found himself in trouble. You know, he was in the will of God. And brothers and sisters, when we are in the will of God, and we are serving God and, and living our lives for God, we will find ourselves in trouble with, with others, with those in the world at times, who are not happy with what we believe and the stand that we take. But you know, if that's why we're in trouble, then that's, that's okay to be in trouble for the things of God. The, trouble, the problem is when we're in trouble because of our disobedience. You know, Elisha, Elijah, as we heard of a few weeks ago, also found himself in trouble. And we see that in First Kings. In First Kings, we see, we see Ahab. And Ahab, we see in, in First Kings chapter 16 and verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of, of the Lord above all that were before him. Ahab was the most evil king that had lived. He did e evil above all that had been before him, and there had been many evil before him. But Elijah was a man of God. Elijah was the man of God. Elijah spoke to God. God spoke to him. When Elijah prayed, God heard his prayers, and God answered his prayers. And we see that as we come over to 1 Kings chapter 18, In verse 17, and it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? You know, he said, You're the trouble. You're the cause of all this trouble, Elijah. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou in thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and followed Balaam. You know, sometimes when you are faithful to God, you will be accused of being you're the, you're the cause of the trouble. You're the cause of this. You're the cause of that. But you see, we see in that that it wasn't Elijah that was the problem. It was Ahab and all that Ahab was doing. And sometimes people will look at the word of God and look at the things of God and say, the problem is Christianity. The problem is these people and the things that they say. But the reality is the problem isn't the word of God. It's the fact that people have departed from the word of God. That we live in a society that now is no time for God or the things of God. You know, they call evil good and good evil. And that's where the problems come and that's where the troubles come from. And you know, brothers and sisters, at times we will find ourselves, we will find ourselves in trouble. But as long as we are in trouble for the Lord and the service for God, they were in good company. But you know, as I said earlier on, if you are without Christ, then you are in trouble. If you tonight don't know the Lord, as your saviour, then you're in trouble. And we see that's why we go into the open air, as we said, that's why we go out and we preach the gospel and we share the gospel because 
There are those out there who are in trouble but don't know they're in trouble. Don't realize the trouble that they are in. Because if, they, if their life ends, if their life ends without Christ, then they'll be in hell. And that's why we pray for you tonight without Christ that you would come to know the Lord. That these wouldn't just be words that you hear week after week, but that the Holy Spirit would speak to you, would convict you of your sins. You'd see you need to repent. You need to come to Christ. Jesus is the way of salvation. You know, we were once in that situation. We were once in trouble without Christ, without hope. And sometimes you find yourself in trouble and you think, there is nothing I can do to get out of trouble. And you need somebody else to come and get you out of the situation. And that's where we are. That's where you are without Christ. There is nothing that you can do that will get you out of the trouble that you are in. There is nothing you can do, no good works, no good living, no trying to reform your life. There's people who change their lives, people who have got real problems, addictions, and they turn their lives around and they help other people. And that is, that is fantastic. But that will not get them to heaven. There is nothing that you can do that will save you but come to the Lord Jesus Christ and repent. And many people think because of they are good people and they live good lives, that that will be enough, that God will look at the good. You know, the word of God tells us that all of the good that we do, good as it, are, as it is, won't bring salvation. The only way is to repent of our sins and confess our sins and ask the Lord to forgive us. And then the next point is to be, it's not in trouble, but to be troubled. We'll turn over to Luke chapter 10. <clears throat> Luke chapter 10. And we see that Martha was troubled in Luke chapter 10 and verse 40. And Jesus had came to their, to their home and in verse 40 of Luke chapter 10, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that, the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. You know, sometimes, we can be troubled about what other people are doing. We can be troubled about what other people are not doing. And we look and think, well, why is this not happening? Why is that not happening? At the end of the day, all we can, we can concern ourselves is what we are doing. What we are doing for the Lord. What the Lord has asked us to do. Are we doing what we can do for the Lord? And let that situation, leave that with the Lord. Because sometimes we don't always know what other people are doing. You know, Mary, Martha looked at Mary and thought, what is, she's just sitting there. I'm doing all this work. Yet Jesus explained what she has chosen as the better part. And sometimes we need to see that we don't always know what everyone's doing. We, we, we don't always know the full picture in every situation. We, we think we know situations. And sometimes we need to trust the Lord that what they're doing is what the Lord has asked them to do. And what they're doing is what the Lord wants them to do. And we see that, you know, we must seek to be and to do what God has asked us to do and to be where God has asked us to be and to trust the Lord. You know, sometimes like, like Martha, we can be doing. And it's good to do everything we can for the Lord. You know, it's so true that we'll never do enough when we consider all that the Lord has done for us. But in the same token, we can be busy in the Lord's work. But the Lord doesn't want us to be that busy that we end up burning ourselves out and doing for the Lord, doing this for the Lord, doing that for the Lord, being here, being there. You know, when God created this world, he created it in six days and on the seventh day he rested. And sometimes the Lord says, you need to rest. You need to take time for yourself. You can be busy, 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 and it can be in a good thing. It can be in a good work. But then what good will that be if after three years of this good work that you are just broken? broken and unable to function any longer. And sometimes the Lord says, you need to take a rest. You need to take time. You need to take time for yourself. You need to take time to, to, to be refreshed and to come again. You know, we, you know, I don't know if you all know, but sometimes if you're up late and up, you're up late at night, then you're up early in the morning and your day is busy, busy, busy. You can carry that on for so long and then eventually you just feel done. And then during the day, 
you're not as worth as much as you should be because you're just you're so so tired, but you've been busy. And you think, I've just got to keep, I've got to keep going, I've got to keep going. And sometimes what you need is to stop, to rest, so that you'll be more effective in the time that you have. And we see that we can be troubled. You know, we're troubled, as I mentioned, we're troubled for those that are lost. That's what takes us into the open air. As we see people passing by in the open air, we're troubled, as I mentioned, for those that are without Christ. For those whose lives are lost. You know, we speak to people in the open air and we see at times they're unaware of the dangers that they're in. And we're troubled for them. We're troubled and we take the gospel and we, we, we pray for them. We pray for our families. We can be troubled over our families that are without Christ. We can be troubled over many things. And it's not wrong to be troubled at times. You know, we can be troubled over health concerns. We can be troubled for our brothers and sisters. We look at some things, our brothers and sisters, we look at what they're going through, and we're troubled for them, and we, and we bring them to the Lord in prayer. And we bring them to the Lord in prayer because the Lord knows. The Lord knows what it is to feel troubled. You know, we see, and I'll just read it, in John chapter, if I've got it here, You know, I don't think I don't think I'm going to I don't think I'm going to find it. You know, the Lord knew what it was to be troubled in His spirit. Jesus was troubled in His spirit, and if Jesus is troubled at times, then we can be troubled. You know, we need to we need to come to the Lord and ask the Lord for help. He asked the Lord to give us peace in these situations. Many things can trouble us. We can be troubled on, on many things and for many for many for many people. There's many people we pray for in the church, and we're troubled for them, but we take them to the Lord. And we leave them with the Lord, that we will find that the Lord will give us a peace in that situation. You know, we think on Wednesday night, our sister Emily came in. I'm not saying that she was troubled, but we see how the Lord has a word for us at times. The Lord just knows exactly what we need, when we need it. And that's what the Lord can do for us, brothers and sisters, because the Lord knows. The Lord knows, the Lord knows your troubles. You know, you might be in the house of God tonight and no one knows, you know, no one knows the troubles I know. But you can. At times, we might be going through things that people don't really know. Sometimes we know people who are sick and people who are maybe having a difficulty. But nobody knows the troubles that you have. Maybe you haven't shared them with anybody else. It's just something that's, but you're troubled about it. You know, the Lord knows. The Lord knows exactly how you feel. He knows exactly what you're going through. Even when other people don't really understand, the Lord knows. And the Lord can, can mend that situation, can give us the answer, can give us an assurance can give us the, the promise, can give us peace in these situations. And the last point is this, it's no trouble. You know, sometimes somebody will say, oh, don't go to any trouble. Don't go, any, don't go to any trouble for me. And you go, oh, it's no trouble. It's no trouble. And it might be a big thing that you're doing for them. And they're like, that. oh, listen, don't, don't, you don't need to do that. And you're like, listen, it's no trouble because if you love, if you have love, then love doesn't see it as a problem. For other people, you might say, don't ask me for that. Don't ask me to do that. The other person says, do you know what? That's not a problem. That's not a problem for me. And as we saw the last time, as I mentioned at the start, to help other people, to be there for other people. You know, sometimes we may never really fully understand the difference we've made in someone's life. The difference we've made, we just think we've just gave somebody a card or a phone call, that we've just giving somebody something, we don't think it's much, but to them, it's made a massive difference in their life. As we saw in, Ma and we saw in the book of uh, in Matthew, as Jesus said, when you visited the sick, when you fed the hungry, when you visited those in prison, when you've done all these things, you've done it unto me. And we see that we can all do that for each other. We can all help people in different ways. And I say, you know, whether it's having a party for a little girl on her birthday, Whatever that might be, it might not seem a big thing, but it's a big thing to them. And we can help one another and do things for one another. And just very quickly, you know, I think it was, I think it was either Gary or Robert was preaching on this just recently about the man sick of the palsy in Luke chapter, Luke chapter 5 and verse 18. Those four friends carried him to Jesus. You know, it wasn't easy to carry him. I'm sure at times he was, if you've ever carried anybody, Right, it become, they can become quite heavy very quickly. But it was love that carried that man. It was love that carried that man to Jesus. They brought him to Jesus. 
when he got there and the house was, was full, it was love that carried that man up onto the roof. And it was love that broke up the roof to say, oh, we're not going to, let's not go right, we've done enough. We've come this far and we can't get in. And they said, listen, let's get up on that roof. Let's carry him on the roof. Let's break up the roof. Let's let him down. And we see that, you know, they didn't consider it to be, a, it, was no, it was no trouble to them because they loved him. And you know, brothers and sisters, when you love somebody, then, then nothing's a problem. You know, in other situations, you might, somebody might ask you for something, you think, oh, I don't think I could get that for you. It's just there. You know, oh. If you love somebody, then no matter what it is, no matter how, how much trouble you go to, you don't see it as a problem. You don't see it as a trouble. You know, in the story of the Good Samaritan, others had passed that man by. And in this situation, the Good Samaritan, he didn't even know who this man was. Nobody was there to say, you know, sometimes you, you think, oh, people are watching, I, be, I better help this person. There was nobody there. There was nobody that was going to say to this man, oh, did you just leave him? He went and he, he, he tended to his wounds. And he put him in his donkey and he took him to the inn and he paid. Why? Love. That's, what, that's what, why Jesus told that parable. Who is your neighbor? Those who you love. And we see, brothers and sisters, within the fellowship that we are here tonight, that we are, we are a family and we can help one another. And we don't do it so people see it. We don't do it for any other reason, but because we love. And somebody say, oh, don't go to that trouble for me. Don't go to that trouble for me. But the reality is, it is no trouble. It is no trouble to help and to be there for one another, to encourage one another. And we just pray that we will always be able to do that. As I say, we may never really fully appreciate the impact that these things have on others. And we've, we've all experienced that someone has done things for us. And we've appreciated it. We've realized the blessing that we've received. And as we come to the end of this sermon, we thank God for what he done for us. He went to the cross for us. He took all that trouble, all that trouble for us, all our sins, all our punishment. He went to the cross because he loved us. And because he loved us, we love him and we can love one another. Amen.